Chapter 16 In the spring of 1941, the crocuses came up in the front yard of 243 Willesden Lane and were a welcome mat of purple flowers for the reopening of the hostel. Repairs had been expedited at the insistence of Mrs. Cohen, who wanted her charges to be reunited as soon as possible. They had been away for several months. On the day of the move, Mrs. Canfield escorted Lisa around the corner to the hostel, embracing her as they said goodbye. I promise I'll come visit, Lisa said. That would make me very happy. I hope thou knowest how comforting it was to have thee. It helped me so with my worries about John so far away. My house will always be thy house. Mrs. Cohen greeted each child with a smile and a hug. Lisa walked happily in the front door and immediately noticed the changes. The blackout curtains now had drawstrings that could be rolled up in the daytime, making it much more bright and cheerful. The windows were clean, the carpet was spotless, and Mrs. Cohen's Victrola was now in the place of honor in the recess of the bay windows, the place where the piano had been and where it was no longer. Lisa was stunned. Had the piano been damaged? Lisa saw Mrs. Cohen glancing at her nervously. Suddenly, a group of teenagers led by Johnny, Aaron, and Gunter jumped up from the hall and yelled, Surprise! Lisa was now totally confused. Before she could remind them that it wasn't her birthday, her friends circled around her, pushing her down the hall into the kitchen. The cellar door was standing open. Follow me, maestro, said Johnny. Lisa followed him down the stairs into the moldy basement. The pickles and preserves had been moved, and in their place was the sturdy old upright piano. Mrs. Cohen stepped carefully down two stairs and peered into the room. It's not the Royal Albert Hall, but if you insist on playing through the bombings, at least you should play where it's safe. Lisa was speechless. When she recovered her manner, she said, I don't know how to thank you. You should thank them, Mrs. Cohen said, pointing to Johnny, Aaron, and Gunter. They did all of the work. The boys took a bow. Now be sure you practice. I would hate to think they brought such a heavy load down these stairs for nothing. Lisa kissed Johnny and Gunter, then gave a romantic smooch to Aaron, and the room broke out in whistles. The younger boys poked their heads in from the kitchen door, adding, Play something, Lisa. Everyone crowded around the piano, pushing aside tins of peas and carrots and cleaning supplies to get a better look. Lisa decided on something playful, an impromptu of Schubert. She hadn't played in a while, and she was nervous at first. She stretched her fingers, shaking them out above the keys, then launched into the piece. One of the 11-year-olds blurted out, Go, Lisa! After the first few chords, Lisa called loudly up the stairs. Oh, Mrs. Cohen, you had the piano tuned. Thank you so much. Mrs. Cohen beamed back. Lisa could only imagine how complicated it must have been with the rationing and the lack of money and the million other repairs that the matron was responsible for. She finished the short Schubert piece with a flourish and everyone clapped. Looking around at the familiar faces, she realized how deeply she had missed her Willesden Lane family. All right, no more time for fooling around, everyone. I have posted the chore list, so let's get to work, the matron said forcefully, and the teenagers boisterously pushed each other up the stairs. Mrs. Cohen came over to Lisa as she was closing the piano. Miss Jura, please come to my room before dinner. I want to talk with you about something. Yes, ma'am, Lisa said, worried as always by the formal tone of the matron's voice. Had she done anything wrong? Maybe she shouldn't have kissed Aaron in front of everyone. Lisa prayed the meeting with Mrs. Cohen would have something to do with her music and would not be any bad news about the many things she always worried about, her parents, Rosie, and Sonia. She knocked on the door nervously. Come in, please, the matron said. The room had been rearranged since the bombing, and all the breakable clutter had been removed, making it as sparse as the Quaker house. Mrs. Cohen was sitting on the bed. In front of her was an open copy of the Evening Standard newspaper. I've been saving this to show you, Mrs. Cohen said, pointing to a small announcement in the middle of the page. It read, Auditions for scholarships and study at the Royal Academy of Music. Applications being accepted until April 1st. Open to all students with a proficiency in musical performance of the classical repertoire. The London Royal Academy? Lisa felt a rush of emotion. This was where the great musicians studied. This was where Myra Hess herself had studied. Could she possibly qualify for such a school? Would you like to apply for an audition, Mrs. Cohen asked. Would they let a refugee girl go to the Royal Academy, Lisa asked. Why shouldn't they? There's no shame in being a refugee, young lady, Mrs. Cohen scolded. Lisa was overwhelmed, not just with the possibility of an audition, but with the gratitude toward the matron. 
She could hardly believe that someone was actually looking out for her, helping her with decisions about her future. She was so used to having only herself to rely on since she said goodbye to her parents two years before. But I haven't studied in three years. You've been practicing, haven't you? I haven't had a teacher. Maybe it's been all wrong, she said, suddenly feeling terribly insecure. Don't you trust your ability, dear? Lisa's eyes were shining, but she was tongue-tied. I take it you do. Are you interested? The phrase, make something of yourself, was center stage in her mind. She knew this would make her mother so proud. It would be the first thing she would tell her when she saw her, an audition at the Royal Academy. Yes, ma'am, I am, she said. She answered firmly. Good. Now let's go to dinner. Mrs. Glazer carried out the steaming platters of meat, and the crowded table clapped in appreciation. She paused before rushing back to the kitchen and said, It's so nice to have all of you back again. If truth be told, I missed your mess. It's been downright boring without you. Everyone laughed. Mrs. Cohen held up a small pile of correspondence. Not many letters are getting through, I'm afraid, but I do have a few. Lewis, Kingman, Weisel, Jura, and Mueller. The letters were passed down the line to waiting hands, and Lisa took hers gingerly. The stamp had the words Republica de Mexico engraved on it, and she didn't recognize the name on the return address. She quickly stuffed it in her pocket. Aren't you going to read it? Aaron asked. It's not polite. I'll wait until after dinner, she bluffed. But the truth was that Lisa was always terrified when she received a letter. The news was never good and brought so many disappointments. She resolved to enjoy what was left of the Sabbath dinner before learning what worrisome things awaited her. After the kinder devoured dessert, Aaron whispered, Go get your coat. Let's go next door. Lisa nodded and disappeared upstairs. The convent door was open. Aaron had brought a blanket and a candle, and they made themselves comfortable in one of the rooms in the front of the building. Will you read it to me? Lisa asked in a small voice, handing him the letter. She was grateful to be in his presence. He opened the envelope with care. The blue airmail paper was covered with neat handwriting and dated March 20th, 1941, only the week before. Dear Lisa, my name is Alex Bronson. I am your brother-in-law Leo's cousin. I am writing to see if you have any information regarding Leo and Rosie, as we have lost contact with them since their escape to Paris. Paris? They made it to Paris? Lisa asked, relieved and worried at the same time. Aaron continued reading. In case you haven't heard, Rosie and Leo pretended to be drunken Dutch tourists returning after a New Year's Eve in Vienna and successfully fooled the Nazi guards into letting them get on the train. They traveled to Antwerp, where my father helped smuggle them into France. We got a postcard a month later saying that they'd gotten married. Then our visas came through and we left for Mexico. That was eight months ago and we have no news of them since. Lisa let out a sob. Aaron handed her his handkerchief. Go on. We pray Leo and Rosie have been able to leave France because we are receiving that Jews are no longer safe there. Deportations have begun to camps in Poland. We are making inquiries to the Red Cross but have gotten nowhere. We are hoping that you may have received some word of them and could get in contact with us since they do not have our address in Mexico. Lisa shivered as she thought about her beautiful sister and tried to conjure up an image of her and Leo safe somewhere. Were they hiding somewhere? Had they escaped? Her head kept spinning. Her thoughts were interrupted by the air raid siren sending out a shrill call. Aaron and Lisa waited in each other's arms until they saw the procession of lanterns and heard footsteps from next door heading for the convent. Maybe it was the comfort of the Willisden Lane reunion that buoyed Lisa's spirits or the time spent in Aaron's arms. Whatever it was, Lisa was humming the Greek concerto to herself when an all-clear signal sounded a few hours later.